All right, so this chapter, chapter 27, um, we're going to cover all the male and the female reproductive system. We should make it through most of, well, we'll make it through all the male reproductive system this morning, and we'll get most of the way through the female reproductive system. Um, you know, we spend a little bit more time here because of the monthly hormonal cycle, so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the hormones and the changes to the uterine lining that happen each month. And then next Tuesday, we'll talk about things like birth control, all the different kinds of birth control methods that there are. Talk about infertility. We'll also talk about a lot of different STDs. So this morning, we're going to do just the reproductive system. So this should help for Thursday for your test, because we're just basically going to review all the parts and pieces. Um, we're going to start with the male reproductive system. And we're going to go over all of the anatomy that I have listed up here. So we're going to start with the testes. So remember, um, the testes are found in the scrotum. And inside the testes, remember we see those seminiferous tubules. Remember, that's where the sperm are formed. And now I mentioned to you in lab that when the sperm get formed, and remember, you can see this under the microscope. If you look at the seminiferous tubule under the microscope, you see the little sperm inside there. When they're formed, um, they're not quite mature yet. They're not ready to um, fertilize an egg. So once they're formed, they go into the epididymis, which is sort of on the back side of the testes. And they're stored here until they're released. And this is also where they become mature. And mature means they're capable of swimming. So they gain a flagellum. They also gain what's called an acrosome. Um, which we'll talk about in a minute. It is basically, I call it a cap. It's like a little cap on the head of the sperm and it has enzymes in it that help it digest through the egg so it can fertilize the egg. Sperm are gonna move through the epididymal duct into the vas deferens when they exit the body. So remember the vas deferens, we also can call those the ductus deferens. These are the tubes that bring the sperm up into the urethra. So we can see here, we have the testes here, and we have the epididymis back here. That's where they go to be matured. When they're released from the body, they come up the vas deferens. They go into the body and combine here with the urethra. So you can see that too brings them all the way in. This is showing you the testes, and now you can see the seminiferous tubules in here. Um, now, one of the things that I mentioned to you before is that, you know, the sperm are being formed outside the body. So a lot of the male genitalia is external. And so the sperm are being formed outside the body and the sperm have to get into the body, right? To combine and, and to get into the urethra. And they come into the body. This is the vas deferens. They're coming into the body through the inguinal canals. These are holes in the abdominal muscles. But these also end up being kind of weak spots where hernias happen. If a hernia happens in that inguinal canal, we call it an inguinal hernia. These are really common in men. Ladies, all of our reproductive organs are inside the body for the most part. Um, so we're making our eggs inside the body, so we don't have inguinal canals. So females, we don't usually get these. This is something that we'll find in a male, an inguinal hernia. How you get a hernia, this is something we talked about in AP1. It's a tear in the abdominal muscle. You already, for men, they already have this weak point here. They already have this opening. And so if it tears more, then they can get a hernia. A hernia is when the abdominal contents start to poke through. Um, you can tear this by straining. Right? So lifting, lifting something the wrong way, straining those abdominal muscles, that can cause the hernia. So this is a really bad one here. Um, how this, um, if, if somebody has something like this, if you push right here, it's gonna feel real squishy. You're gonna be able to squish it in. And the minute you let your hand go, it's gonna squeeze right back out, okay? If somebody has a hernia, they need to have surgery to fix that. Usually they have to stitch it back together, put mesh on top of that tear. Now remember the vast difference when they get into the body, where they combine with the urethra, y'all looked at this in lab, it's called the ejaculatory duct. I'm gonna go back to this picture um, and I'll circle it right here. So right here, you saw that in lab, 
right, that little area, that's where the vast difference is meeting the urethra. Now remember, the sperm are made in the seminiferous tubules, but we gotta add fluid to the sperm to make semen. The fluid comes from three sex accessory glands. The seminal vesicles, those are the ones in the rat, they look kind of bumpy. These are gonna produce the largest amount of seminal fluid. The prostate gland, this is the one that sits right under the bladder. And then another one that's much smaller called the bulbourethral gland, it sits under the prostate. And so we say basically um, that the sperm make up less than 1% of the volume of the semen. So 99% of semen, of seminal fluid, is, is the, the fluid, it's the liquid. Only 1% is sperm. Um, the chemical components that we find in that fluid include a whole bunch of stuff. Remember, I think I mentioned to you that when we did fertility treatments, the doctor used to call it the Powerade for the sperm. So it has sugar in it. Sugar is going to give the sperm lots of energy so they can swim and find the egg. There's also a buffer that helps to um, neutralize um, vaginal secretions. Vaginal secretions are really acidic, and so by themselves, they actually kill sperm. They're, uh, the vagina doesn't like sperm at all, so those secretions would kill it if it didn't have that buffer. And then also prostaglandins. The prostaglandins in the fluid actually cause uterine contractions, which help to propel the sperm out to the fallopian tubes, where they can fertilize the egg. Okay, so we can see, again, the sperm are getting made down in these testes here. Okay, they're coming up this vast deferens. You can see it coming all the way in. And they're going to dump into the urethra right there at the ejaculatory duct. Right, and so the three accessory glands are here. Right, those are our seminal vesicles. Here, this is our prostate gland. And here, has the bobo-urethral gland. And all three of those are going to add fluid to the sperm to make them swim better and help neutralize um, those acidic vaginal secretions. Now, I will mention um, really quickly, we'll talk about this later in this chapter, but I want to talk about a vasectomy. Um, a vasectomy, there's not a whole bunch of male birth control methods, right? I mean, if we think about how men can um, prevent, uh, can prevent pregnancy, it's basically a surgical procedure, like a vasectomy, um, abstinence, or a condom. That's it, right? Now, the FDA recently approved a pill. Um, it's a male birth control pill that can inhibit sperm production in men, so I think it's great that men are starting to have more options to prevent pregnancy, uh, but right now, that's all they have. Now, vasectomy is a surgical procedure. Typically, it's not something that can be reversed very easily. And with a vasectomy, essentially what they do is they cut the vas deferens and they tie it off, okay? Now, a lot of men are opposed to having a vasectomy because they're like, it's going to ruin my manhood. I won't be able to ejaculate. Nothing's going to come out. It'll be terrible. Sex won't be good. Um, not, none of that is true. Um, so when they cut this little tube right here, um, they haven't cut the testicles off. So they're still making testosterone, and they still make sperm. All they've done is they've made it so the sperm can't get out. Um, and in fact, they still ejaculate. Fluid still comes out, because the fluid is being produced up here by these three accessory organs, right? And they're making up 99% of that seminal fluid. So that's still gonna come out. A man can still ejaculate. There's just no sperm um, within that semen, okay? Now, as a man gets older, a lot of times the prostate will get a little bit bigger. This can cause um, some issues. It can, because of where it's located, right under the bladder, it circles the urethra. If the prostate swells, it kind of pinches on the urethra, and it can block the flow of urine. And usually this requires surgery. They have to go in and remove the prostate. Now, this is also a really common place where cancer can happen in men, so prostate cancer. Um, so they can do blood tests to look for markers for prostate cancer, um, but this is also why when men have to have their physicals, the doctor puts the glove on and sticks the finger up the rectum. Um, and basically they can identify if the prostate is enlarged that way. So if we look at male anatomy, if we go back, you know, here's the prostate, here's the rectum. And so just by palpating this area here, they can 
see if that prostate is a little bit enlarged. Um, so remember, sperm are formed in the seminiferous tubules, right inside the testes. And when sperm are formed, I'm not going to go back over meiosis. That is something, or meiosis, I don't know how you, how you all say it, I say meiosis. That's something you all should have learned in general biology. But we are going to talk just a little bit about sperm formation. Sperm are formed from special cells called spermatogonia. Spermatogonia are the gametes. These are the cells that undergo meiosis. Okay, so there's only very special cells that can go through meiosis, right? The spermatogonia and then also the cells in the female body that produce the egg. So the spermatogonia undergo meiosis and you get four sperms. They're called spermatids. And what's special about these is that they have half the number of chromosomes. How many chromosomes is half the number? Uh-uh. 23. So they have 23 chromosomes. A full complement of chromosomes is 46. And honestly, this makes sense, right? If we think about it, if a sperm has 23 and an egg has 23, sperm fertilizes the egg, you get a single cell with 46 chromosomes, a full complement, right? Now it's going to eventually turn into a baby. It's going to go through mitosis. So half your DNA, truly, half your DNA comes from mom and half comes from dad, right? Um, those spermatids, those four spermatids will eventually differentiate and become sperm. In order to become sperm, a couple thing ha things have to happen. Um, they have to eliminate some cytoplasm so they can become more streamlined. And I'll show you a picture here. All right, so we're looking up here at uh, spermatogonium. Okay, and that spermatogonium goes through meiosis and it produces these four spermatids, right? We've got those four there. And you can see we went from 2N, which is 46 chromosomes, to N, which is 23 chromosomes. And that term 2N and N should not be new to you, correct? You all are familiar with that? Okay. Those early spermatids just look like cells, right? They don't even have a flagellum. And then eventually what's going to happen is they look more like sperm. They have a flagellum. They have um, a head. But notice they have a lot of extra cytoplasm. So we got to get rid of that. we got to make them more streamlined because these have to make it through that little oz of the cervix, through the uterus, through the fallopian tubes, and then they got to penetrate into the egg. So we don't want a lot of extra stuff on them. Right? We need them more streamlined. So we get rid of some cytoplasm. They form that flagellum. And they develop, here's that term that I've been mentioning, an acrosome. An acrosome is that enzyme cap that helps them digest through the egg. Think of like a chicken egg. Um, the shell of an egg is hard. Well, you have the same thing in your body, ladies. The egg is not like super soft. It does have this sort of hard coating on the outside that the sperm have to be able to penetrate through. This is showing you the seminiferous tubule. So this is like exactly what you look at in lab under a microscope. So here's that seminiferous tubule down in the testes. And you can see it's producing all those sperm. Um, in the picture, the microscope in lab, you can see the sperm really well. Men produce a lot of sperm. They produce somewhere between 200 and 300 million sperm every day. That's huge. Um, average ejaculate contains 240 million sperm. And the reason is because a lot of them get lost. So when, and I'll show you in the next chapter, um, I'll show you the percent of sperm that when they're released in the vagina, what percentage actually ever even make it out to the fallopian tubes. So a lot of the sperm, when they get released in the vagina, they stay in the vagina. Um, they don't actually make it through the eyes of the cervix. Only a tiny percent can make it up the cervix. And then once they get into the uterus, the uterus on the inside has folds. It gets stuck in there. And then they got to find the opening of the fallopian tube. And a lot of them can't do that. And then if they make it out in the fallopian tube, they never really find the egg. Um, so you, there's a lot of sperm that get lost in the process. And so there's power in numbers. You got to have a lot being released so that some can make it to where the egg is. And again, you know, I wrote this one on the board. When a sperm fertilizes an egg, 
you get something called a zygote that has a full complement of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes. Now the other thing we looked at in lab is when you're looking at the testes, not only do you have the seminiferous tubules making sperm, but the testes are also involved in producing <coughs> testosterone. So they make testosterone, and the testosterone gets made in the interstitial cells. The interstitial cells um, are basically found outside those uh, seminiferous tubules. So, um, you know, testosterone plays a lot of really important roles um, in, in man. One is it actually helps to stimulate sperm formation. But some of the other functions, you know, I have listed up here, these are things we've talked about in anatomy. Things like um, facial hair and the pattern of male hair that we find. So whether it's on the face or the chest, all of that is stimulated by testosterone. Um, vocal cords, it causes them to get thicker. And remember, what happens to the pitch of the voice when the vocal cords are thick? It's lower, right? So it also is involved in causing that male voice to be lower. It causes the laryngeal cartilage to get bigger. This is why men have an Adam's apple and women don't. It also causes more sebaceous gland secretion, so it causes your skin to be more oily. And so this is why when kids start going through puberty, acne is really common. It's also really common when men are taking like anabolic steroids. Um, it causes a lot of acne issues. Testosterone also causes bone and muscle development. So it is responsible for the big growth spurts that men go through when they hit puberty. Um, and also causes their muscle mass to get greater. Like I mentioned, um, there is a link between acne and testosterone because testosterone does stimulate the oil glands. Anytime dead skin cells block the pore, um, oil can collect. Notice, you know, this is something we did in AP1. Oil glands are always associated with a hair follicle. They keep your hair nice and soft and supple. So if it's ever blocked, that oil will back up. We call that sebum. And it can cause an infection, right? And that's when we get a pimple. So we've talked about um, how sperm are formed. We've talked about testosterone being created also in the testes, in the interstitial cells. So um, I also want to mention the penis. This is erectile tissue. It'll fill with blood during arousal. And there is something called foreskin that covers the shaft and the head of the penis. And so, you know, it's common in the United States that uh, we circumcise boys when they're babies, when they're in the hospital. Like my son was circumcised before I even left the hospital. Um, and with circumcision, this is basically a surgery where they remove the foreskin. Um, babies are awake, they um, usually will put like a clamp um, around the foreskin to remove all the blood from the area and then they just cut it up. Um, and the reason that foreskin gets removed, why this has become such a common practice, is because it helps to lower the reduce of things like STDs, especially AIDS. Um, you know, foreskin has a really oily secretion and it can harbor bacteria. And so if you choose, if you have a child or if there's a, a boy that is not circumcised, it is really important that the parents show that child how to clean himself, good hygiene, making sure that it stays clean because otherwise infections and bacteria can really harbor in that area. So good hygiene is really important if the foreskin is present. Um, when the penis fills with blood, um, there, the, there's a large vein that normally would drain the blood out of the penis, but when it's filled with blood, it pushes on that vein and it prevents it from draining. And so this is what can lead to an erection. Um, now there is a condition called erectile dysfunction. ED for short. <clears throat> this is the loss of the ability to sustain an erection. And like, I mean, you can see up here, there's a whole lot of reasons why ED can happen. Marital conflict, stress, fatigue, smoking, alcohol, low testosterone, atherosclerosis. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, so, you know, ideally, um, you would want to get at the root cause of what's causing this, um, but it's a lot easier to just take a blue pill. So we have pills like Viagra and Cialis that can relax the muscle, allow it to fill with blood, so a man can have a sustained erection. 
Now, sperm will get released. We call this ejaculation. This is a reflex. Um, and um, it actually causes contractions in the muscles around the epididymis. And this is going to propel the sperm along with all the fluid from the accessory glands into the urethra. So um, now that we have all the parts and pieces of the male anatomy, let's talk a little bit about the hormones that men have. Um, that are part of the reproductive system. So the first one that I have listed up here is called interstitial cell stimulating hormone. Um, and this one controls testosterone secretion. If that makes sense, if you just look at the name, this is a hormone that stimulates the interstitial cells. Remember, these are the cells that you find in the testes that produce testosterone. So you have a hormone that causes those cells to make more testosterone. Okay, so it controls testosterone secretion. We also have a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone. This is a hormone that stimulates the interstitial cell stimulating hormone. So these are hormones that we talked about in AP1 when we talked about the endocrine system. Um, so this hormone, interstitial cell stimulating hormone, this is coming from the pituitary gland in the brain. If y'all remember, the hypothalamus is the boss of the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland cannot release this hormone by itself. The boss, the hypothalamus, has to tell it when to release that hormone. And so the hypothalamus will release this hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone. It goes to the pituitary and tells the pituitary, hey, release interstitial cell hormone. Testosterone levels are low. We need to beef them back up. So these two hormones usually work together, okay? Um, usually, this is the first one to get released, and this is the second to be released, right? Because this is coming from the hypothalamus, and this is coming from the pituitary. And the hypothalamus is the boss of the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus, if y'all remember in the brain, this is an area of the brain where you do not have a blood-brain barrier. So it's constantly monitoring the hormones that are in your blood. So if your hypothalamus sees that testosterone levels are low, it goes, oh crap, I'm gonna release gonadotropin releasing hormone to tell the pituitary to release interstitial cell stimulating hormone so testosterone levels can come back up. So this is going to subside when your testosterone levels are normal. It'll, the hypothalamus will stop releasing gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Okay. Another hormone is called follicle-stimulating hormone. This is a hormone that stimulates the follicle cells. The follicle cells are basically the seminiferous tubules. So this one stimulates sperm formation. This is a hormone that be, can be used in... Um, fertility treatments. So this is a hormone that I took because follicle cells in the man make sperm, follicle cells in a female make eggs, right? So I had to give myself injections of this hormone so that I can make more eggs, right? But men, if their sperm count is low, can give themselves injections of this hormone to make more sperm, okay? So it's the same hormone, just in men and women, it's gonna cause the follicle cells to make follicles, whether it's sperm in a man or eggs in a female. So this is just kind of showing you the link between interstitial cell stimulating hormone and that gonadotropin releasing hormone. So it's kind of a weird picture, but they're trying to show you up here. This is the hypothalamus in the brain. And you can see, if y'all remember the pituitary gland, when we did the endocrine system, we talked about all those hormones coming from the pituitary gland. It's so many, we divide it into a front pituitary and a back pituitary. Right? And so this is just trying to show you how the hypothalamus is the boss, and it'll release that releasing hormone, and that tells the pituitary to release the interstitial cell stimulating hormone, and that'll make your testosterone levels come up.